Welcome to the Chemistry Labs here at Ave Maria University. My name is Dr. Hillesheim and I will be walking you through our Chemistry Laboratory Safety Lecture for today. Please note that all the information found herein is also located in your syllabus for the lab. I would suggest that you read through your syllabus before you come to your first day of lab to make sure that you have covered all the material that you may need to be safe while you are in the Chemistry Labs here at Ave Maria. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email, or you can also send your other faculty members an email also, and I'll be happy to walk you through any of the questions you might have regarding the labs. Before we get into the safety portion of our lecture, we need to discuss the overall goals and ideas of the chemistry lab. The first and most important thing to know is that there is a syllabus that's accompanying this lab and you need to download that copy from the Canvas site and read through that document. A lot of the questions are answered within the syllabus and a lot of the rules and regulations that we have in place are very specifically documented in that document. Now, I don't need you to memorize the syllabus. But what I need you to do is read through it and then do three things. Think, use common sense, and pay attention. And if you do those three things, you're gonna be following all the rules and regulations that we have in place. And if you do those three things and you're following the rules, then nothing is going to happen. And that is our goal. We want to make sure that nothing happens in the lab that could potentially harm some of our students. So we need to make sure that you're following all the rules and regulations. Violations from any of these rules will deduct, you know, will result in the deduction of points from any of your graded assignments. I don't want to take points away. You guys don't want to lose points. So all we're asking you to do is do these three things. Think, use common sense, and pay attention. And then we're not going to have any issues about grades or points. If you continue to ignore our safety rules or if you continue to ignore any of the instructions from your teacher, then we will dismiss you from the lab. I've never had to do this. We don't want to do this. So again, we're just saying, let's follow the rules. Let's do these three things. And then we're not going to have to worry about any of these more harsher issues that might come up. The last point that I want to stress throughout any of this is that if you have any questions or concerns about anything in the lab at any time, just stop what you're doing and just go find the appropriate person, right? Come talk to myself or one of the other faculty members and we'll make sure that you have any of your questions answered. Now we're going to discuss some of the rules that we have about the attire and what we're going to be wearing while we're in the chemistry laboratory. Now the reason why we have all these rules in place regarding attire in the chemistry laboratory is shown here in red. It's to minimize the potential exposure of skin to chemicals. Now what we mean by this is that the problem that might happen is if you spill something and it gets in contact with your skin. That's where the chemical might burn you or it might cause some other kind of reaction with your skin and that's what we want to avoid. So the reason why we have these kind of extensive rules about what to wear while you're in the lab is for your own safety and it's to minimize any potential exposure to any chemicals. Now the most important rule that we have is that everybody is required to wear safety goggles or safety glasses while they are in the teaching labs at all times. Now these goggles or glasses should be university or departmentally approved. And if there's any questions about that, just come see one of us and it shouldn't be too much of an issue just to see if you have the right style of goggles or glasses. Now, these goggles and glasses should be worn at all times as long as anybody in the room is working with a chemical. So, even if you yourself are not working with any more chemicals, if you're done with your experiment for the day, but one of your fellow classmates is still working with them, you are required to have your goggles on. With respect to what you should be wearing, let's talk about pants. So, in general, we are requiring long pants to be worn. What that really means is that your ankle should be covered, and so if you're looking at yourself from the waist down, there should not be any exposed skin. Right? So, we that basically means no shorts, no leggings, no capris, no spandex, yoga pants, or any of these athletic style tight long pants. Now, with respect to what we discussed in red up at the top of this slide, the whole idea again is to minimize the potential exposure of chemicals. 
Now, if you spill something in the lab, chances are it's going to go down. And what I mean is, if you knock over a chemical on the bench top, it's probably going to run off the table, and the first thing it's going to hit is your waist. And when it hits your waist, it's usually going to go down, because that's how gravity works. Now, what that means is if this chemical is getting spilled, it's going to basically go down to the floor, and if there's any exposed skin along the way, it might get in contact with that. So please make sure that you're wearing the right attire. Any of these tight uh, athletic style wear is not what's going to be appropriate, especially in the organic labs. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we have the specific organic lab training also. So what's the quick 10 second summary for this? Wear some jeans, wear some khakis, or if you want to wear shorts, make sure you have a pair of scrubs or something like that to pull over them. Just make sure that if you look from your waist down, there's no skin exposed. No ankles, all right. With respect to shoes, make sure that you are wearing full coverage shoes. So basically a tennis shoe is what we're talking about here. No sandals, open-toed shoes, ballet style shoes or anything like that. So what, we looking, what we're looking for here is that you're wearing a full coverage shoe and make sure that you have socks with that also. For a shirt, a simple t-shirt would be just fine. No tank tops or anything like that that might uh, be uh, showing a little bit too much skin for what would be deemed safe in the lab. Now at some times you will be wearing a lab coat also, but despite wearing a lab coat, I would recommend you not wear your nicest clothes while you're in the lab. Uh, just in case something does happen, you don't want to ruin a nice, you know, $40 shirt here just because we happen to spill something on it. So here we go, the picture we've all been waiting for. What you, should you look like in the lab? Uh, make sure you're wearing your goggles that are departmentally approved or uh, university approved. If you have any long hair, make sure it's tied back. You know, we can give you a rubber band or something like that. Uh, we just don't want your hair falling into any of the chemicals either. You wear a simple t-shirt, sleeves, you should be having some sleeves just to offer a little bit more protection. Make sure that your t-shirt, if you raise your arms up, you shouldn't be exposing any skin with that also. Long pants all the way down to your ankles and full coverage shoes. Now let's discuss some of the specific safety regulations while we are in the chemistry labs. In general, this is what we're looking for. No food, no drinks, no cell phones, but we'll talk about this a little bit here in detail. So with respect to cell phones, now we understand that your cell phones are important to your everyday life and I think we all end up using them, but what happens is if you're using your cell phone while you're in the lab, first of all you're going to be distracted from what you're doing and that's going to cause two things. If you're distracted, you're not going to be paying attention to what you're doing and that can lead to some safety problems. If you're not paying attention to what you might be boiling or what you're mixing together, then you might end up uh, having something boil over or you mix two things together which shouldn't be, and that can just lead to some problems while we're in the lab. The second thing is if you're not paying attention, that's going to take you a lot longer to finish your lab. Now, while we usually give you guys plenty of time to finish your labs, we give you plenty of time to finish your labs as long as you're working efficiently. And so oftentimes when we're using our cell phones, it's not exactly for educational purposes. So it's in your best interest to keep your cell phone away. The other reason for this is if you're in lab and you're working with chemicals, you're probably going to have some chemicals on your hands. And then if you take your cell phone out and you start you know, playing with it, then you're going to transfer your chemicals from your hands onto your phone. And then when you actually use your phone to call somebody, you're going to put your phone up against your face. So at that point you've transferred chemicals from your hands to your phone and then to your face and that could end up causing some problems also. So in general, if we're talking about using cell phones while you're in the lab, think, pay attention, use some common sense. Wash your hands or pick a time where you are not going to be distracted when you're going to be using your cell phone. So just think about what you're doing before you do it. Long hair tied back, we don't want any of your hair falling into any of the chemicals while you're in the lab, or if we're using our Bunsen burners, we don't want your hair to catch on fire. Your hair is spectacularly flammable, but we definitely do not want to see that while you're in the lab. 
no gum, tobacco products, eating or drinking while you're in the lab. There's really no exceptions to this. Just as we discussed with your cell phone, eating or drinking while you're in the lab is a good way to transfer chemicals into your body just by virtue of being in contact with something around the lab, which you may or may not be aware of. Now, if you need to grab a drink of water or if you have a water bottle or if you brought a snack with you or whatever it is, you know, talk with your professor, you know, say, hey, I need to step out of the lab for just a minute to grab a quick snack, you know, take a, you know, take a minute or two, do what you need to, but make sure you wash your hands before you're doing any of these things also. Dispose of all chemicals as directed by your professor, and it's usually also very explicit in the lab manual what to do with it. You'll see in the bottom right hand side of the slide here, you'll see some white plastic containers that have red lids on top of them. This is what your waste containers are going to look like. Now, these red lids, make sure you move them out of the way before you dispose of chemicals, and make sure you're putting your chemicals into the right containers. It's usually very clearly labeled as either aqueous waste or acidic waste, basic waste, organic waste, whatever it might be. So make sure you're putting the right waste together with the other parts of the lab. If you don't know which container you're supposed to use, talk to your instructor. The one thing I will say about this is that no chemicals should go down the drain. No chemicals should go down the drain unless you have explicit permission from your instructor first. In general, there's not going to be much that we put down the drains at all. So really what I should be saying here is that put everything into the waste container unless there is some explicit instruction otherwise. If you have any broken glass, make sure you put it into these special broken glass containers. They're these cardboard blue and white or sometimes just white containers that are located throughout the labs. These containers should be used for broken glass only. They are not to be disposed uh, or they should not be used to dispose of anything else. If you have any questions, again, just chat with your professor. Any other trash should be put into the trash cans that are usually at the end of the rows or near the fume hoods that are in the lab. Uh, make sure that you do not put any chemicals into these containers. Right? These are just regular trash, and so make sure that you're putting the right waste into the right containers, whether it's chemical waste, broken glass, or just regular old trash. Professional behavior is what we expect at this point. You all are professionals with respect to your careers as a student. You guys have been students for quite a while. We expect you to act like a professional while you are in the lab. In general, that means don't you know goof off, no pranks, no unsupervised lab work. Uh, act like an adult, right? And what we mean by that is to think, to use some common sense, and to pay attention. There are a couple of important pieces of safety equipment which we need to be familiar with while we're working in the chemistry lab. First, we need to find where the safety shower is located. Now the safety showers are either in the lab that you're in or they are in the hallways right outside the labs. After you're done with this, your TA will show you where the safety showers are. Now a safety shower is designed to be used when you spill a significant quantity of a bad chemical onto you. Remember I said earlier in this lecture that the problem happens when a chemical gets in contact with your skin. And the purpose of a safety shower is to make sure we wash that chemical off as quickly as possible. These safety showers are designed to put out a large amount of water at a very fast rate for 15 minutes. And what I mean is that as soon as you pull the handle on the safety shower, you're basically going to be drenched with water and they will not turn off for 15 minutes. And so that means that you're going to flood the lab or the hallway where you are using the safety shower. And that's okay. If you need to use a safety shower, you need to go ahead and pull that lever. But what I want to say is that this is not something you should be playing around with. Do not pull on the handle for a safety shower unless you need to use it. Now a safety shower is not a nice pleasant shower like you might be comfortable with at home. A safety shower is designed for if there is an emergency. As I mentioned, not only will you end up flooding the room that you're in, but also remember the point is to wash the chemical off of your skin. So if you have to use a safety shower, you're basically going to do it au naturel, just like you do it at home. Now I know that you guys do not want to get naked in front of the rest of your section. And you're never going to have to use a safety shower as long as you do the three things that I asked you guys to do, which is think, 
pay attention and use some common sense. But if there is an accident and you have to use a safety shower, these are the rules that have to be followed. Now, if this is a situation that occurs, we will deal with this in as modest a way as possible. And we will call the EMTs to come over and take care of you also. And they'll take you over to the hospital and get you checked out. I don't want to be telling a story in one of these future videos about a student of mine who had to use a safety shower because of some unfortunate accident. So please pay attention to what you're doing and then you're never going to have to worry about using a safety shower. The other piece of equipment is the eye wash station. You'll see it here in the picture with your safety shower. This little gray funnel that's at the bottom. Now an eye wash station is to be used in case you get something in your eyes such as a chemical. But you all are never going to get anything into your eyes because any time that you guys are in the chemistry lab you guys are going to be wearing your safety goggles. And if you're wearing your safety goggles properly you are never going to get anything in your eyes. A hot plate is pictured here, a little ceramic white top with a gray bottom here that we basically plug into one of the outlets. Now a hot plate is used to heat up any of the chemicals or to stir some of the reactions that we have. It's basically a stove top. I don't have to tell you guys that if you are using your hot plate, assume that it is going to be hot. Okay? If you're boiling some water, it's going to be at a high temperature. You don't want to set anything onto your hot plate that you don't want to be heated up. We have quite a few incidents where students set uh, their lab manuals or something else and it ends up melting their equipment that they set on top of the hot plate because they weren't paying attention. Please pay attention. If you've been heating something up, assume that it is hot. If you've been using your hot plate, assume that it is hot also. Don't set anything on your hot plates that you don't want heated up. And the last point is, if you have been boiling some water or heating something else up, Assume that the piece of glassware is hot and you don't want to be picking it up with your hands. Use some crucible tongs, as pictured here, to pick up your beaker and move it around. Let's discuss some of the specific emergencies which might happen while you're in the chemistry lab. First, what to do in case there is a fire. It should be noted that our instructors are trained to use fire extinguishers, so if there is a fire which starts while you're in the lab, then you know please let your instructor know, although if there is a fire I'm sure they'll have noticed very quickly. Let your instructor know and then they will come over there and take care of that and assess the situation. Um, if there is a fire in the building and the alarm goes off, or if we need to evacuate because of a fire alarm, we ask that you follow your instructor to one of the meeting points that we have outside the building. And the meeting points are highlighted in red. And they're either in the uh, parking lot, the commuter parking lot there, which is uh, to, the, to the south of the building, or uh, to the north of the building into the field. Uh, if there is a fire alarm, we do need to clear the building out and leave space around the building so that in case any fire trucks or any EMT personnel need to come in, we can't be standing around the building. So follow your instructor outside the building into one of these designated areas and your instructor is going to do a head count to make sure that everybody's there so please do not wander off if there is a fire alarm don't go get lunch or something like that make sure your instructor knows where you are if you happen to spill something on you we've talked about this quite a bit uh, the immediate thing that you need to do though is make sure you wash uh, any affected area with water for 15 minutes and send your lab partner to go inform the instructor in case they aren't aware of what's going on uh, we'll come over, we'll assess the situation, and you know, if we need to, we'll take you, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll walk with you over to the uh, emergency clinic and get anything taken care of that we need to. But make sure if you do happen to spill something on your hands, immediately start to wash with water for about for 15 minutes. If there's a tornado or a hurricane or any other kind of shelter in place alarm, we just ask that you stay with your instructor. We'll give you the specific instructions based on what's going on. Whether those instructions are okay, everybody go home, or whether, hey, we need to you know, go down to the first floor and hunker down until the uh, weather passes. If you do happen to cut yourself with some broken glass or something else that we're using in the lab, you know, please go let your instructor know immediately. We do have first aid kits that are around on the floor and in the labs. 
Uh, if it is a severe emergency, again, we will call the EMTs to come over and take care of you, and we will assess that situation. But please let your instructor know. Anything else, uh, again, we just ask that you please let your instructor know for what's going on, and we're, we're going to be there to help you guys out, okay? But the, the one thing that I will say with all these different circumstances is please inform your instructor if they're not aware, and the other thing is please follow the instructions from your instructor. We need to cover what's known as the Hazardous Communication Right to Know Law. This is a national law which covers a lot of the procedures and policies which we've set forth herein. I do need to read this slide out to you, but within here I want to stop and break down certain parts of it. So at the beginning, any, any student, contractor, subcontractor, vendor, salesperson, or visitor shall be informed of any hazardous chemicals used in the areas being visited or areas where a person will be working. Now what this means to us as an instructor means that we have a responsibility to you as a student or whoever else is in our labs to let you guys know what's going on in the labs and what chemicals are there. The teaching research and other laboratory facilities are considered as the workplace for many university employees and students. Therefore such facilities are not exempt from the rules and regulations of this law. Students in laboratory classes of the university shall have as part of their curriculum instruction orientation at laboratory safety, including notification of the requirements of the hazardous, hazardous communication right to know law. So let me break down this paragraph here real quick. So all of the stuff that we've been covering in this lecture here has been to fulfill this very kind of short paragraph here within the law. You'll notice that it says that students in laboratory classes shall have as part of their curriculum instruction orientation to laboratory safety. That's what you guys are doing right now by watching this video. The other side of this is that for every lab that we're doing, there will be a pre-lab that's associated with it, which means that you are required to attend these pre-labs so that we can all fall under the regulations of this law. If you don't attend your pre-lab, you're not considered specifically trained to be allowed to be in the lab to conduct that, conduct that experiment. And if you're not trained to conduct that experiment, then you fall outside of this law and we can't let you complete the experiment. So please make sure that you're there for the pre-lab and complete any pre-lab materials that your instructor may assign to you. Again, if you have any questions about this, check the syllabus and come talk to one of us. Requirements for completion of this chemistry course necessitate that each student handles or uses certain chemicals. Some of these may have an adverse effect on the health of a fetus. This is especially true for the first trimester of pregnancy, but later trimesters of pregnancy are susceptible as well. The current state of knowledge of the effects of chemicals on pregnancies is such that we cannot clearly state that any given chemical is completely safe, while another is not safe. Although protective equipment and lab procedures are designed to minimize contact with all chemicals in this lab, some exposure is possible. Now there's a lot of important information in this paragraph. The obvious one is that if you fall under the uh, medical treatment by a physician, if you, meaning that if you are pregnant uh, and you're under treatment with one of your uh, physicians for that, just come let us know. I'm not saying you can't complete the course or you won't be able to take the course. It's just this is something that we are required to know because we do have to communicate with your primary care physician to make sure that you're going to be safe while you're in the lab. The second part covers everybody, and that's the last sentence, which says, although protective equipment and lab procedures are designed to minimize contact with all chemicals in this lab, some exposure is possible. That very short statement right there covers why we have the specific attire and safety rules in place to minimize exposure to chemicals. Finally, if you are pregnant, you are advised to consult with your physician regarding the completion of this course at this time. A list of chemicals will be furnished to your physician upon request to the lab director. This is kind of this statement just finishes the idea that we mentioned that if you are pregnant, we just need to know about it, and so we can address this in the proper situation. I should speak in a broader context that if you have any allergies to specific chemicals or any of the materials that we're using in the lab, that you should come and talk with us also so that we can assess that situation. And so that means that you as a student need to be aware of what's going on in the lab, which means that you're going to have to read your lab before you actually show up to do the lab. You can't be aware of what's going on if you aren't prepared. 
and to be prepared you need to make sure that you read through the lab before you get here I'm not talking about memorizing the lab I'm not talking about studying it for hours on end I'm talking about giving it a read through to make sure that you know what is going on so that everybody can be prepared when they do come to the lab so in conclusion I just want to remind you that all information that we discussed today can be found in the lab syllabus which is located on canvas I want to remind you to please always think about what we're doing, to pay attention, and to use some common sense, and you guys will be doing just fine if you do those three things in the lab. Remember to be on time, and to have some fun while you're here in the chemistry lab.